So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But they answered, We are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answered Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in Him. He answered them, This is the truth. Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son or a daughter? They belong forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm so glad you've come to worship. Let's sing together. Water you've turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's no one like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are high Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's no one like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are high Healer, awesome in power, our God, our 
thank you, God, that you've won all of our battles. You're fighting for us, God. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. And right now, I know you're able. And my God will come. Everything's possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. A new wind is blowing right now. Breaking my heart of stone, taking over like it's Jericho. And my walls are all crashing down. And right now, I know you're able. And my will come through again, yeah. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I a battle, never lost a battle, you never will, you never lost a battle, you never lost a battle, you never lost a battle, you never will, you never lost a battle, you never lost a battle, you never lost a battle, you never will. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. Oh, yeah. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I Cause you never lost a battle No, you never lost a battle And I know, I know You never will, yeah You can do all things You can do all things But fail Cause you never lost a battle No, you never lost a battle And I that God will never lose a battle because greater is God on the inside of us than he that is within the world. Well, in my family, we have a wonderful history 
of men and women who have served their country in the armed forces. And my father was one of those people. My father was raised not too far from Atlanta in rural Alabama. He was born in Alabama and was raised in the Mississippi Delta and my father served in the, uh, in the army. And it was very interesting and it's good to note just so that we can be aware of the fact that my father was, he, he shed his blood, sweat and tears on the battlefield, yet he could not drink from a public water fountain or eat at a restaurant or use a public restroom. Uh, in the city where he lived, yet he he um, served his country and sacrificed his time and his efforts on the battlefield. Well, my father was called to active duty to um, to defend our country during World War II, and he was in in Belgium. My father drove an ammunition truck. And one Saturday, uh, as our family, we always rehearse these stories so that we won't forget them. And the story goes that my father was driving the ammunition truck on a Saturday afternoon when he and his company were ambushed um, by the enemy. And everyone in his company were taken as prisoners of war. And thank God, later on into the night, they were all able to escape. But in the scuffle, they were all separated. And my father found shelter in a farm, in a barn, a potato farmer's barn until he could decide how to get back to his company. Well, as he was trying to devise a plan, he heard footsteps coming into the barn. And he heard those footsteps getting closer and closer to where he was hiding under a loft of hay. All of a sudden, he heard and he felt the jab of a pitchfork as it lunged into that stack of hay. And when that happened, my father flinched and he was discovered. The farmer who owned that property and owned that bar lifted up a, uh, an arm load of hay off of my father to find a black American soldier staring back at him. Now that farmer, that man that, who owned that potato farm, had a lot of options. He could have stabbed my father with that pitchfork and ended his life, or maybe he was armed with a gun. We don't know, but that farmer had a lot of options. He could have even gone hand-to-hand -hand combat with my dad and made the best man win. But a miracle happened that morning. That farmer took that loft of hay and placed it right back on top of my father and left his barn, giving my father the opportunity to escape unharmed. And later on that morning, my father was reunited with his company. And it was a Sunday morning, but it wasn't just an ordinary Sunday morning. It happened to have been Easter Sunday morning. My father heard the chime of bells back in the, in the distance. And you have to understand that our family, we are so blessed to have a wonderful history of many preachers, generations of preachers and pastors in our family. And my father tell, told the story. He's in heaven with the Lord now, but we, we remember him telling this story that when, when he was captive, held captive by the enemy, he cried out to God and he said, God, if you'll deliver me, I'll preach the gospel. And God was true. He, he delivered my father. And my father rededicated his life to, to Christ and was later called into the ministry to pastor. And my mother and my father left the South and went to the North during the Great Migration of the mid to late 1940s and settled down in Jackson, Michigan. My oldest brother was born in Mississippi, but the rest of my siblings and I were born in Michigan. And it would be there that I would, Sunday in and Sunday out, hear my father preach the gospel. And I came to know the Lord and began to serve the, my father's church as their piano player and choir director. But here's the bottom line of the story. You probably have members of your family who have served uh, in the armed forces and served our country and served our country well. Or maybe you have um, neighbors or friends who have placed their life on the line. And the details of all their stories, of all of our stories, of all of their stories might be different, but the outcome is the same. These men and women placed their lives on the line. They sacrificed, they shed, some of them shed blood, sweat, tears, some even gave their lives for the sake of freedom. And so I want to, in their honor and in their memory, um, to sing this medley of, of songs about America. I want to sing it for my father, for my relatives that fought for America. I'll sing this for you and your family, and I'll sing it as unto God. And I hope you enjoy this. God bless. 
this a miracle Spacious skies for amber waves of rain, for purple mountains, majesties. pray together and thank God for this great country and also for the freedom that we have not just because men and women in our country died but because Jesus died to give us freedom in him let's pray together father God we love you today and we thank you God for the freedom that we enjoy uh, because men and women have sacrificed their lives but God we thank you for the ultimate freedom that Christ has given us freedom from death, sin, hell, and the grave. Thank you, God, that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in you will not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you, God, that whatever we're facing, whatever challenge those who are watching today are going through, thank you, God, that you are greater. Greater are you on the inside of us than he that is within the world. Thank you that whatever we're facing, that you're already there. We, ha we can be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we'll let our requests be made known unto you, and you'll give us the peace that passes all understanding. Bless those who are watching, and just wrap your loving arms around them. We love you today, God. And it's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Peter Gill, and I'm seven years old. I accepted the Lord and Savior and went to Eastside Baptist Church. My grandma took me to Sunday school, and I learned about Jesus, and I accepted him into my heart. I decided to go to the New Believe class to get baptized. I wanted to get baptized because my dad did, 
And I would think I would like to get baptized because I accepted the Lord and Savior into my heart. Peter came to an understanding of Christ in our New Believers class for children. And today he wants to publicly identify with Christ. There, there is nothing saving about this water. What the water represents is cleansing. It's an outward expression of what happens inside one's life when they come to know Jesus as Savior. And so today, Peter, it's with great joy that I baptize you as my brother in Christ. Would you just take my, take my hand right here? Just take my arm there and take your other arm and just hold on to me, okay? Let's do it like this right here, okay? All right. Peter Gill, I gladly baptize you now, my little brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in his likeness and raised again to walk in newness of life. God bless you, Father. Hi, everyone, and happy 4th of July weekend. We are so glad that you're joining us online or you're here in the room today as we remember what it is to live in this nation and our responsibility as Christ followers in this country with all that we are facing. Thanks so much for being here today. Today, my title is simply this, Which Way, America? Which Way? America. And there are two Old Testament passages that I'd like for you to, to look at with me. The first is found in Lamentations chapter 5, verse 21. Listen to the word of God. The prophet Jeremiah laments and he writes about the people who say, Restore to us to yourself, Lord, that we may return renew our days as of old. The context here is the people wanted to be restored back to God so that they could experience his forgiveness, so they could experience his blessings. This is the, the context of the land of Israel at that time during the time of Jeremiah. These were people that had been out of sorts with God and rebellion against God and they repent, they turn and they want his covenant promises back in their lives. And they wanted to do it before it was too late because they knew that the, the judgment of God was upon them. They knew they needed to turn to the Lord. And then the second passage of scripture that I would encourage you to take a look at with me is Psalm 80. Psalm 80. In Psalm 80, beginning at verse 3, and then moving to verse 7, and then in verse 19, we see basically the same verse repeated three times with words or commentary in between the sameness of the repetition of what he says here in verses 3 and the other two. It's almost, if you will, like in a song, uh, three choruses, or a chorus that is sung three times in a row. It says in verse three, restore us, O God, make your face, and that speaks of the Messiah. We believe the Lord Jesus Christ in our context today. Restore us, O God, make your face shine on us. Why? That we may be saved. Then again, in verse seven, here's the repetition. It's the, it's the chorus repeated again. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. And then there at the end of Psalm 80, verse 19. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. So the psalmist not once, not twice, but three times prays 
that God would restore and save his people Israel by his grace. Now at the time of this particular writing, uh, it's a Psalm of Asaph, and what Psalm of, the Psalm of Asaph is, is, is written, or the time that it's written, is during the time of the northern kingdom of Israel, the United Kingdom had been divided, and Rehoboam takes the southern kingdom, and Jeroboam takes the northern kingdom, and Jeremoam makes so many terrible mistakes and creates, if you will, new false pagan religions. But there is a place here in the Psalm of Asaph where he prays on behalf of the northern kingdom of Israel for them to be restored to God. Not once, twice, but three times. There it says, restore us, God Almighty. Restore us, O God. God, save your flock. God, have pity on your people. And God, Revive your vine. All of this idea of a nation coming back to God. Now, compared to many European nations, the United States is quite young. In just a few more years, we will celebrate our 250th year as a country. And in that 250 years, while it may seem like a, a long time, our, our, our nation has been spanned by the lives of just a, just a handful of presidents. Let me explain. Both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, our second and third president, presidents, died on the same day, July 4th. Yes, July 4th, 1826. They both passed away on the same day. Jefferson was in Virginia and Adams was in Massachusetts. That year when they died, 1826, Abraham Lincoln was already 17 years old. Lincoln becomes president, 1860, 1861. He is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth at the Ford Theater at the end of the Civil War in 1865. The year that Lincoln died, Woodrow Wilson in 1865 was a boy already eight years old. When Woodrow Wilson died, Gerald Ford was already 10 years old. Look at that progression. Just a handful making these connections. So Gerald Ford became president in 1974. And in 1974, our present president, Joe Biden, was already 35 years old. Look at the names on the screens. There's a connection, just a handful of presidents of connectivity from our second president all the way to our present president. We are a relatively young nation compared to so many others in Europe. The rise of the United States has been rather quick, especially after World War II, we became incredibly dominant and very powerful. But I think a question before us this morning would be this, Eastside. Could our fall be even quicker than our rise in the last 60 to 70 years? The year that I graduated from high school, there was for the first time something we see a lot now, but there was for the first time kind of a national effort, state by state, to reduce our get rid of firework shows and firework sales, lots of states, um, around the 4th of July. And the hope by some were that they were concerned about safety in some places. In some states where it had been dry, they were concerned about the potential for fire. And there were some who just simply wanted a more quiet 4th of July. They just wanted it a little bit more quiet. However, today in our country, I sense that there is a different kind of quiet, a different kind of quiet in America. And I think that quietness is, if you will, the lessening of the volume or the celebration of, of simple patriotism are lessening the value of patriotism, or pushing down or trying to make quiet the value of being open and celebrating your love for your country. 
I think in my life over the last 20 years, your life too, and I think though that over the last 20 years, uh, we've just not celebrated America the way that we used to. In fact, I think that all of us would agree if we are just sensitive to the culture and sensitive to reports, that there is a lot of unhappiness in the United States. And this isn't just limited to the United States, it really is a, a global issue. In fact, just this past week, the last week of June, the Gallup Poll Organization released a, a new poll revealing that the world is unhappier and more stressed out than ever before since Gallup began asking the question years and years ago. They found in this Gallup poll released last week that stress was up significantly. Sadness and worry all had inched up in the polls to an unprecedented level. And I think if we're honest, we can sense when we shop or when we bank or when we travel or when we just begin to talk to our neighbors and friends and fellow church members, people in, in society, people we work with or people we go to school with, that there is just a lot of, a lot of unhappiness in our country. Here in the United States, we have seen over the last years a real intensification of the, the lessening of confidence in our institutions. Um, it's common knowledge that Congress and its approval ratings are at an all-time low. Just this past week, in reaction to some of the Supreme Court decisions, you see um, lots of questions related to the courts and how those courts are run or who are in those courts. And approval ratings for even the Supreme Court is at an all-time low. There is always problems and faces and challenges faced by the presidency, but the presidency, this administration and last, and in previous, and it just seems it's always there, but it seems worse than ever. Confidence in the institution or office of the presidency are at significant lows. And then people are not confident in the family, the traditional family. When you see marriage breakups and you see children that don't have a, a mother or father at home to take care of them, you see the family under attack and losing confidence as an institution, our country. We can see that in business and things that business are involved in beyond their own business to try to make certain kind of political statements or stands. And as a result of that, people lose confidence in business. There's media, the news, and the entertainment industry at all-time lows of confidence. The, the Academy Awards are at an all-time low in viewing. And this past Academy Awards, we saw violence on the stage on a presenter by a member of the audience, both high-profile entertainers. And people look at that and they just lose confidence. There's the famous phrase, fake news. The left accuses the right of fake news. The right accuses the left of fake news. But what happens is the news media finds itself losing credibility. It can make its way into sports. It can make its way into religion with so many terrible stories in the Catholic world and our own Southern Baptist world related to sexual abuse of children. We find that even religion can be at an all-time low, confidence in religion. And even our military, which historically in this country has had high ratings, the military is, is, is seen by many as being questionable as there are certain political stands and statements being made when it comes to our country. It's not so much the soldiers who serve, but the leadership who tells them what to do and sets policies in place that they have to live by. And I think what happens is that ordinary people like you and me, I think we're pretty ordinary, folks that go to work and try to live peaceable lives and raise our families, I think lots of us in this country have been thinking for quite a while now that something's just not right. I think we silently and maybe say to our spouses or to our closest circle of friends, we, we kind of say, what's, what's wrong with everybody? What's, what's going on in our land? What's going on in our country? And the United States, in spite of its 
incredible past of accomplishing so much good for the world and opportunities for ourselves, I think all of us, if we're honest, if we will peel back and be transparent, that all of us feel that our nation is facing some serious, serious problems. Archibald MacLeish, a name probably not familiar to you, but he was a member of the Roosevelt, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt administration, later a writer, and he served as a primary leader in the Library of Congress in his lifetime. Archibald MacLeish wrote these words. He said, the founding of America was more than a political event. It was a promise, a promise to the colonists and to the world at large that people could govern themselves and that they could live in freedom and equality. The assumption was that they would act in accord with reason and equity. And out of this came what we often call the American dream. I think today we hear more, we, we, we hear less, if you will, about the American dream, which was very common in my youth. I think we hear less about the American dream and more from many people about what they consider to be the American nightmare. And I'm not alone in thinking, and I'm not being cynical when I say this. I want to present all through a biblical worldview. But I wonder sometimes if I'm not alone in thinking and wondering, has the American dreamed vanished? I think of it for my children. I think of it for my grandchildren. And I think if you again are transparent, it's something you may think about too. I am not alone in wondering if the undoing of our nation, which is very, very possible. Let's not kid ourselves. I wonder if the undoing of our nation will not be because of enemies without, but because of our moral weaknesses within. In my humble opinion, we are a very sick nation. We are a very ill nation. And the symptoms of our national condition, I think, are pretty clear. And what I've done is put some groupings together of some ideas and be interested to see how you respond, see if you agree or disagree. But these are views I hold as I value my relationship with Jesus Christ and the authority and inerrancy of his word. Here is one national condition that I think is a big problem. It's a grouping here. I put together anger, disillusionment, and cynicism. I think that defines a lot of our American attitude right now. It was bad before COVID, and I think it's gotten worse. And there is disillusionment, anger, disillusionment, and then there's cynicism when someone does something, tries to do something good and noble and pure, You've got cynical attackers that will go after them, I think, like never before. I think anger, disillusionment, cynicism, it's, it's everywhere. I think people in our culture have, for the most part, lost their enthusiasm and their optimism about their future. Present day things play into it, like inflation, gas prices, understand that. But two years ago, there were other things. And there will always be many things in a big nation that is adrift from God. But, but keep in mind that these are things that are in front of us and can impact and affect our culture. And what these three things do, anger, disillusion, or cynicism, they create, if you will, an atmosphere of, of mistrust and suspicion. And if you don't have trust with people, you don't have foundational strength in any kind of relationship. I think this is one of America's ills, anger, disillusionment, and cynicism grouped together here. There's a second illness, a second symptom of what has happened in our nation, and that is that we are a nation that has experienced a loss of national integrity and character. It's been building for a long time. Back in 1968, Richard Nixon ran for president due to rising crime. He was going to be the he was going to be the guy who would uh, stand against crime and he would punish those who would uh, 
would go against him. And in the 1960s, in the Vietnam era, there were rising bits of crime all over this country. And we're there again, but even at a more exponential rate. In our nation, we are experiencing rising crime and violence. Uh, There are particular cities that I could point out where every weekend there are, it seems, a dozen upwards of innocent people, children oftentimes, little boys and little girls, who get murdered just because they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. We see violence, people pushing other people off of subway ledges or edges and push them onto the track as a subway train comes forward. We have a real problem in our country in the crime when it, crime when it comes to, to property and dishonoring property. Um, there's large amounts of stealing and looting and shoplifting. We have in our nation a, a, a real challenge now where people are confused and are being, I think, groomed by others to be confused about their gender. Where the Bible says that he created male and female in our country today and in our academic institutions today and even in some places of government, there are now recognized over 120 different genders. And then we look at the issue of marriages which can be unstable and divorces which are quick to get. There is the redefinition of marriage all impacting our country. And we've been battling now some 50 years on the issue on the side of life in the womb, an anti-abortion position. And by God's grace, I thank God for the decision that was made just a few days ago or announced publicly. 50 years of abortion on demand at least being somewhat curtailed, but the tragedy is, is good news as we have gotten, those of us who are taking a pro-life position, is that there will still be probably half of the states in our country where abortions will continue. And that that has an impact on our nation. We've lost, if you will, national integrity, and we've lost character. I think another thing that plagues us is a sickness in our land, and it's simply an age-old problem, a creation-old problem after sin, and that is a preoccupation with unworthy things. A national preoccupation with unworthy things. I'm talking here about materialism, um, sex, obsession with sex, Um, a hedonistic view of pleasure, eat, drink, be merry, an Epicurean approach to life, a pursuit of ultimate selfish satisfaction, a pursuit of lacking self-sacrifice, a preoccupation with me, myself, I, me, ism, my opia, if you will, and, 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 and so much of what we do is we, we put those things in place of trying to deal with what the consequences of sin really are. We just don't want to face the consequences of sin in our society, which if you peel that back, it leads to all other kinds of ugly things. Instead of pursuing excellence and family, and marriage, and fidelity, and integrity, and holiness, and doing what is right. Beloved, we have become a nation that pursues unworthy things, celebrates it, honors it, awards it, rewards it, and it has created a sickness in our land. Now, fourth and final observation, and I think this is obvious to every Christ follower who is uh, tuning in today or watching here in the room at Eastside, 
I think the most obvious to Christ followers when it comes to an illness in our land is that our nation has lost our fear of God. We've just lost our fear of God. You know, when, when we study the Bible, and I hope that you study it daily, when, when we study the Bible and we look through the lens of history and the context of when things are written and who's the audience, what's the culture like, who are the leaders, what's the system in place, when we study the Word of God, we are introduced to a, a grouping of nations, most often the nation of Israel, and other nations too, Babylonian kingdom, the Syrians, the Persians, the Medos, the Medians. We, we're introduced to the Medes, Persians, etc. And when we're introduced to them, we see them that they become a nation that reaches a point of no return. Now, I, I don't think those nations know when that point is. It's only after the fact or after the point takes place that they realize that it is too late for them. But again, the Bible is filled with all kinds of illustrations, all kinds of historical examples of countries that just found out it was too late, found out it was too late for them, and they'd reached a point of no return. The verses that we looked at just a moment ago in introduction, and that's Lamentations 5 and Psalm 80, those two passages of scripture are where a nation of people, it's primarily here in two historical contexts, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel are subsidiaries of, their, subsidiaries of that, meaning the northern kingdom, which was also existing near the time of the southern kingdom. What you find is you see these are nations that are crying, listen to this, they are crying out to God for help. And God heard them. In Lamentations 5, 2, I think where he is praying here, and he basically is saying in these verses, he's saying here, restore us, O God. I think that's a nation or that's a prayer that our nation should be praying right now. It's what we need to pray in America as we approach our 246th birthday. God, God restore us. And then in Psalm 80, you have one, two, three times an echo of what is in Lamentations chapter five. God restore us, restore us, O oh God. God restore America. Restore us. That should be our prayer. Now, as I conclude this message, I want to return there to Psalm 80 and just comment there on what these verses teach us. And I think they teach us three vital things in the year 2022. And the context of the United States of America in alignment with the nations who realized that they needed to turn. The first observation that I would offer here from these verses is we need to be turned. We need to be turned. We can't turn ourselves. Listen carefully, please. I'm not an isolationist when I say this. I believe in engagement as a Christian in the culture every aspect of culture. We need to be turned, but we can't turn ourselves by laws, by legislation, even Supreme Court decisions. Our country, our population needs a change of heart, needs to turn their hearts toward the Lord. Our issue is sin against God. That's the great national issue, in my estimation, of the United States. Look, our nation has never been perfect. But there was a time in our country's history when our nation knew and feared God. They had a respect for deity they had a respect for the person and work of Jesus Christ. That 
existed in our nation. But over a period of time, our nation, through leadership, through secularization, through pushing back God and his word in the culture, our nation pushed the presence of God, the desire for God, the engagement of God, just simply pushed God out. And over that period of time, our nation, generation after generation, I've seen so much in my lifetime compared to when I was a little boy. Our nation has just pushed God out and, and, and we have become increasingly secular. Not more religious, more Christian, but increasingly secular. And I think as a result of that, true judgment has come upon our land. I think we are experiencing today the judgment of God. Listen to the words of Paul in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 verse 18. This is the beginning of some of the most hated portions of Scripture in all the Bible by secularist activists today. He says in verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. He doesn't say the wrath of God will be revealed. He's saying the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godless and wickedness of people who actively, in context, are suppressing the truth by their wickedness alone. As a nation, we need to be turned because verse eight and the following verses very powerful and very much hated by the secularist, really does reveal the wrath of God, the judgment of God being upon us. We need to be turned. There's a second thing here that I would encourage you to see, and it's found back in Psalm 80. We need God's turning. We need God's turning. He, he says in Psalm 80, it says especially there in, in, in verse 7, basically it says, he says, restore us, God of hosts, or restore us, God almighty. Mighty God, we need you to restore us. One writer said, only God can change the heart. Knowledge cannot do it. Experience will not do it. Law cannot do it. We can try to profit from past mistakes. We can even make good resolutions. We can bind ourselves with restraints, but without the mighty gospel of the cross, nothing will save us. There is really only one doorway to eternal life, and that door is Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Now, should we engage as Christ followers in the culture with cultural issues? Absolutely. Should we be salt and light in a secular, lost, flavorless, dark world? Absolutely yes. But we need to recognize that central to change is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we will hear from, um, from our circle of churches that something in society is a quote-unquote a, a gospel issue. I would encourage everyone to be careful that we don't become more engaged in the gospel issue than we do the gospel itself. And I think with those that understand the context of that, get what I'm saying. It's the gospel. It, it, it's God who gives us the ability to change. We, 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 we need to be changed, but we need God's turning to change us. Now, the last thing we have here is in Psalm 80 is it says we shall be saved. Therein lies a promise. One writer said, yes, God can meet our nation's need. If we sincerely call out to God and to turn us again and cause his face to shine upon us, it says here we shall be saved. And that was the experience of Israel Seven times in the book of Judges, it's recorded that Israel fell away from God. 
Seven times Israel knew the bitterness of bondage. Seven times in tears, Israel turned to God. And God, by his grace, delivered them every time he saved them. And God responds to nations. Indeed, he does. Hear what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 18, verse 8. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to, un to do unto them. In Jeremiah 24, verse 7, it says, I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and that they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. This is what America needs. America needs a change of heart, but it's only something that God can give. It cannot be done by legislation or edict. The famous historian Arnold Toynbee pointed out that only 19 major civilizations have existed since the beginning of time, and only five remain today, one of which is Western civilization. So what is the cause of our nation's trouble? What's the cause of our nation's sense of loss, our anger, our pain? Is it the politicians elected? No. Is it the judges that are in our courts? No. Is it the media? No. The cause of our nation's problems is sin. Rebellion against God and his word. A loss of the fear of God. It's when the people say, to God, return us, O Lord, renew us, bring us back to how we were once with you, that we will begin to see the nation, the United States, or any other nation, on the road to recovery. One of the statesmen of our nation, going back to the 17, especially 1800s, was Daniel Webster. Webster made a statement years and years ago that almost seemed prophetic now. Here's what he said. If religious books are not circulated among the masses and the people do not turn to God, I do not know what will become of us as a nation. If truth be not diffused, error will be. If God and his word are not received, the devil and his works will gain ascendancy. If the gospel is not felt through the length and breadth of this land, anarchy, misrule, degradation, misery, corruption, and darkness will reign without mitigation or without end. There's a theologian out of Chicago, his name Ken Boa, great history in teaching and reasoning through the scriptures. He wrote this. He said, people are not lost because they have not heard. They are lost because they are sinners. We die because of disease, not because of the ignorance of the proper cure. Someone later said that a paraphrase of Ken Boa's comments might read this way. We are not lost because we don't know what's right and wrong. We're lost because we do know, and yet we still choose wrong. And if that doesn't change in America, then our hope is dimmer and dimmer by the day. Paul wrote in those hated scriptures, Romans 1, hated by secularists, he said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Which way? America. Let's pray. Father, today we thank you for the opportunity we have to live in this land we thank you that the gospel of Jesus Christ with all of our land's struggles and falling away from you, the gospel is still going forward. 
May we, your people, turn from any wicked ways that we are embracing, any considerations of compromise that we're making. May we turn away from that and turn to you and ask that you restore our nation and that you would, among people here, that you, Father, would forgive us all of our sins, our stubbornness, our pride, our our pursuing all the unworthy things, and that we would look to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we would proclaim your word, and that we would work very hard to be agents of light and salt in this secular world. We do pray for America. We pray that you would save our nation, return us to a time when we respected and feared you. May we be diligent in doing that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. Happy 4th of July weekend to you. And may God bless you as our prayer.